Hello and welcome everyone. My name is Kristen Talbot and I'm the program manager for Maiden Project. Thank you all for joining us today and our friends at Cherokee for hosting today's session, Osteoarthritis, Evaluation and Management of the Most Common Types of Arthritis with Dr. Gerson Bernhard. Dr. Bernhard is a clinical professor of medicine at University of California, San Francisco. He retired from his own practice after several decades in both community and academic practice of rheumatology in Wisconsin and Northern California. Since then, he has continued precipitating physician, oh, rheumatology fellows at Stanford and UCSF and instructing medical students as well as general physicians, nurse practitioners, and physician assistants. <clears throat> he has been an advocate for the comprehensive care of patients with rheumatic disease and in, in the past headed a 24 bed inpatient rheumatology unit. The American College of Rheumatology has honored him with the Bodding Phelps Award for service and education and made him a master of the college. And we are so incredibly lucky and thankful to have him as one of our Maven Project volunteers. So Dr. Bernhard, when you're ready, please begin. Oh, thank you very much, Kristen. So I have no disclosures and we can move on from that to the topic of osteoarthritis, which is, and I hope that uh, these objectives are obtained to ensure that the primary care providers can identify the clinical features of this and discriminate away from the inflammatory rheumatic diseases of which there are many. We're gonna review some of the current best practices for treatment and we'll talk about the pathophysiology of osteoarthritis and get into a bit about the some of the experimental interventions which uh, may <clears throat> ultimately reverse joint damage and of course that will change the uh, outcome of osteoarthritis considerably. Uh, this is clearly the most common rheumatic arthritic connective tissue disease that afflicts all mammals, not just humans. So uh, with that in mind, let's look at how many. Probably 15 to 20% of a population have symptomatic disease. Now, that doesn't mean they may not have uh, radiographic changes or even some clinical changes, but doesn't bother them and they can function well. Uh, as a matter of fact, if you are, say, 70 years old and you don't have some evidence of osteoarthritis, you're not alive. About 35% of people over 65 will have radiographic knee osteoarthritis changes. That may be asymptomatic. And that's one of the issues that you need to understand that there's a poor correlation between what is seen on a radiograph and what is clinically important. <clears throat> Clearly, osteoarthritis of the knee is one of the most common disabling diseases in the United States. Uh, and the cost is billions of dollars, which is difficult to determine. That's the business of direct care. And that would probably include the orthopedic reconstructive surgery. The loss of work time, the loss of the need for uh, additional help, uh, which is really a reflection of disability, uh, change, uh, those things are all sort of built into this cost and probably doesn't cover everything. It's, uh, <clears throat> but it's, it's truly significant. I might also point out that your patients who have osteoarthritis usually are older, and have by that time accumulated other chronic diseases, cardiac disease, chronic pulmonary disease, some renal diseases, certainly uh, endocrine diseases, most commonly uh, type two diabetes. So they don't come to you with just arthritis as a rule. A few of the uh, do, but the majority are going to have some other disease process going on. And that means they're probably on other medications and we have to be, and that's one of the points I'm going to make is that we really have to be aware of that and try to limit the medications so we don't 
run into too much polypharmacy. So what do those patients come in and complain of? It's pain in my hand. It's pain in my fingers. It's pain in my knee. I have, can't walk as well. I have trouble with stairs. It's localized pain in contrast to, the, say, the patient with rheumatoid arthritis or other inflammatory arthritic diseases where it's more diffuse and involves multiple joints. Now, clearly, some of these people are going to come in and say, well, it's my hand or it's my wrists or my thumbs or both of my knees. <clears throat> if you ask them this, yes, sure, they're stiff in the morning, but that usually wears off fairly rapidly and is pretty good during the day, particularly if they pop a few uh, pain fillers during the day. And then it comes back with rest or uh, overnight. But generally speaking, putting the joint at rest is fairly comfortable. Uh, they may, and particularly if you ask them, have limitation of motion. And you have to be rather specific and say, well, what is it you can't do or you have trouble doing? Reaching things, walking for any distance upstairs, downstairs, uh, being able to uh, put on their shoes or socks, uh, showering and, and being able to get to the bottom of their toes, uh, being able to do, cut their toenails. Simple things like that have now become a little more difficult or considerably difficult. If you ask them or you look at them, uh, there's localized muscle atrophy. That's because the, the motion of the joint is lost and uh, those muscles aren't using. I can use my own hands as an example. Look at my right hand and you will see that the thenar muscle is pretty good. Look at the left hand and see that there's a difference in the way I abduct my thumbs and the fact that I can't use this as freely and the our muscle atrophy. And there is often joint instability. And we're going to get back to that a little bit because you're going to, it's most notable in the knees. Most other joints, if nothing, if anything, they're more stable because they're limited. <clears throat> when you examine the patients, look at their fingers, their hands, Heberden's nodes are knobby, distal interphalangeal joints. Bouchard's nodes are knobby, uh, proximal interphalangeal joints. You can look at them and see squaring of the first metacarpal phalangeal joints with the thenar atrophy that I already demonstrated. Knees, if you look at it, ask them or examine them and see that they have limited extension. A knee should fully extend to 180 degrees. And uh, you may be able to identify some instability. And we're going to go into some of that, those clinical findings uh, as we discuss this. Look uh, for them at, at Genuvera. I would urge you that if a patient is complaining of these things, get them out of the exam room and have them walk down the hall and you get a sense of what it looks like when they walk. There, there's a thing called varus thrust. As they walk down and they have knee problems, you will see that they actually, the knee goes out a little bit as they, with each step. <clears throat> varus means bow leg. Uh, and bow legs are common. Get your patient comfortable on a good exam table, preferably a totally flat exam table. Have them relax their quadriceps muscles and see if there's any increased fluid in the joint. You know, a little bit of increased fluid is common with osteoarthritis and particularly things called or popliteal cysts, often called Baker's cysts. And you can feel this posteriorly. Uh, 
once in a while, those cysts will actually rupture and give pain down the calf and will confuse uh, the examiner in thinking that the patient has thrombophlebitis. And indeed, they may secondarily have a, a, a leg vein uh, thrombophlebitis. But it's the cyst that is ruptured and is moved down into the calf muscles. <clears throat> In regard to the hip, so again, have them walk and see if they have what's called an antalgic gait in which they sort of roll over uh, that uh, hip because the hip no longer moves in a fashion, in normal fashion. Get them uh, <clears throat> adequately undressed and comfortable and see if they have a positive favor. That's flexion, abduction, external rotation. These should be equal and comfortable relaxing and the clinical issue is are they now able to put on their socks or tie their shoes if they're not or if it's difficult they probably would have a positive favor test look for flexion contractures do they arch their back in order to be able to straighten out their hip again you will see this most prominently if you get them to walk. Shoulder pain, <clears throat> see if they have limited abduction in their activities. So <clears throat> if I can't bring this all the way up, that's limited abduction in function. You can then relax them and I'll examine them for limited abduction uh, very easily. And remember, you wanna block <clears throat> the, uh, you want to block the shoulder so that they don't compensate with extra shoulder motion. And you will say, oh, the shoulder was fine. No, it isn't. If you block it and hold it, then you see that, oh, no, the shoulder doesn't really move all the way. There is a thing called, <clears throat> we can get some evidence of whether or not they have uh, <clears throat> tendinopathies. And particularly if uh, they have a problem with either the supraspinatus or infraspinatus uh, tears, which are very, very common, particularly as pe people age. And <clears throat> there's a thing called the empty can sign, which you simply have the patient put their arm out, palm up, and rotate it around as, they were, as if they were emptying a can and emptying it out, and in that position, then apply some pressure superiorly and ask them to raise their arm against your resistance. And if they say, oh, it hurts, or they can't do it, you have clear evidence that they either have impingement and they up in the shoulder, and impingement is because they've already torn their supraspinatus uh, muscle. Get them to take their shoes and socks off and look at their feet. Bunions are common. Along with it is common hallux valgus. And pronation is also very common. And the minute the patients have pronation, it begins to change the biomechanics of the entire lower extremities, particularly at the knee. Look for them to have what's called hind foot valgus. Not only do they have pronation, but you can actually see the, <clears throat> the Achilles tendons and the hind foot sort of splay out. And we'll come back to why that's important and what we can do about that or improve it uh, <clears throat> without medication. Now, here's an example of what I'm talking about. <clears throat> Here we have his classic Heverton's node. And here, look at the bony enlargement here and here. These are Bouchard's nodes. And if you get a little bit of a sense of that, this is sort of squared off a bit. And there's an inability to fully extend and they compensate. And here's a, again, I use my own hands as an example of the compensation. My right hand, <clears throat> I can abduct that thumb starting 
at the first carpal, metacarpal joint. On my left hand, I cannot abduct at the first carpal, metacarpal joint, so I'm hyperextending at the IP joint of the thumb. And the consequence is that my thumb does not move normally and I have secondary uh, muscle atrophy. And probably some pain and tenderness. And sometimes you can actually get, as you squeeze them, you can get some crepitus. Uh, let's move on to the next one, if I can find there. there. Occasionally, you will see a patient who has a little cyst like formation. This is early on in the development of the Heberden's node. Actually, what that is, is uh, synovial fluid. It's a synovial extension, and it's a little cyst. It's benign. You don't have to worry about it. There's no particular reason to aspirate it, though it can be aspirated, and it will ultimately disappear and become a bony enlargement, and we're gonna show you some uh, evidence of that radiographically. <clears throat> Here's another example of what I'm talking about. This is early on in the beginning, the first inflammatory characteristics the development of a Heberden's node. It is not <clears throat> usually infectious. It has to be discriminated from the uh, dactylitis, which occurs with psoriatic arthritis, but <clears throat> it can be observed and usually it is present along with other evidence of Heberden's, whoops, let me go back. Other evidence of Heberden's nodes such as you see here in the fifth. And then this is one developing here. <clears throat> Radiographically, what does this look like? <clears throat> as osteoarthritis progresses, instead of bone loss, uh, as a rule, there is loss of joint space, but there is bony proliferation at the same time. So th this discriminates it from the erosive changes of either psoriatic arthritis or rheumatoid arthritis. And rheumatoid rarely involves the distal interphalangeal joints, which tends to tell you to <clears throat> differentiate. At the proximal interphalangeal joints, again, instead of seeing erosion of bone, though there is a subset of what's called erosive osteoarthritis, but I won't bother doing it because it's a small fragment of the total uh, patients with osteoarthritis. If you look at it, you see here again the osteophyte formation, which is the bony reaction to the loss of cartilage and the narrowing of the cartilage and some sclerosis of bone, with sparing, as a rule, of the MP joints, which are more commonly involved with rheumatoid arthritis. And here you begin to see the involvement of the first carpal metacarpal joint without any significant involvement of wrist joints, though they can secondarily be involved. Here's a close up of that same first carpal metacarpal joint, osteophytosis, joint space narrowing, sclerosis, but sparing of the other carpal joints. You see, those are looking good. And any good radiologist will be able to identify this and help you. <clears throat> but in the absence of that, simple hand films will give you a lot of information. <clears throat> Here's an example of what I'm talking about with hip osteoarthritis. And this is the inability to fully extend uh, the hip joint. The consequence is that the patient tends to rotate out laterally and flex at the knee. And if they want to get <clears throat> up straight, they hyperextend on the back. And sometimes they'll come in and say, well, doc, I don't walk the same way and I have low back pain. 
with the low back pain is because they're running around with a hyperextended spine in order to compensate for the knee. You can identify this best by having them, again, adequately undress and have them walk. As they walk, they're going to sort of roll over and limp on that knee. It may be very subtle at first, and in advanced and more advanced, it will be more obvious, and you'll see them actually limp. You can identify this even as you walk down the street and see people uh, sort of uh, limping along. You can say, aha, I know that patient has osteoarthritis. What does it look like radiographically? <clears throat> Here, you see a little bit of joint narrowing, maybe a little bit of osteophytosis, but basically a normal uh, femoral head. Here we're seeing loss of joint space again, osteophytosis, and beginning to flatten out that femoral head. And also notice how that seems to be moving in. Notice that there's more bone space here than there is here. So the result is that that involved hip doesn't move well, and it even gets worse at this point. This hip isn't going to move very well, and it's going to give a lot of pain, particularly weight-bearing, but also at other times, because this hip doesn't move well, the patient tends to compensate, and the result is that the whole lower extremity is not moving well, and they begin to get a muscle, a quadriceps muscle atrophy, much like they do with <clears throat> osteoarthritis of the knee, which is the next one. Here's an example of what I'm talking about with genu varus. Notice the bow leg. As this patient walks along, this knee will move sort of laterally a little bit. And it may be a lot, and it really sort of, and that's what we call varus thrust. You see that along with a bow leg, along with some quadriceps muscle atrophy and some bony enlargement, particularly most noticeable at the tibial plateau, that patient has significant osteoarthritis. And <clears throat> radiographically, this is what it may look like. Most often, it is the medial joint that goes first. Sometimes it's the lateral joint. And if we have patients with this sort of combination, one lateral, one medial, we have what's called windswept knees that tend to we're both roll to one side. <clears throat> Again, notice that part of the joint is well-maintained. With nice space, there's probably a good meniscus in here. But here, we have lost joint space. We have osteophytosis. Sometimes you will actually get little areas of bone necrosis, which are quite painful as the patient will walk. And we have some osteophytes. These are bony reaction, and here again, osteophytosis, particularly at the femoral joint, but also posteriorly. And there's loss of cartilage and probably significant damage of the menisca. What I cannot see on this film, I'd love to show you, is also that there's probably a little increased joint fluid, most <clears throat> commonly seen at the, patel in, at the uh, patellar pouch. Here's an example of <clears throat> what is also exceedingly common, and that's degenerative disc disease. These joints are not diarthroidal joints. They're so-called synarthroidal. There's a disc in here. There's no joint. <clears throat> there's no synovial lining here. The synovial lining part of joints in the spine are back here, the facet joints, right in here. And that's where the arthritis part of the spine degeneration comes. Otherwise, it 
is secondary to degenerative disc disease. Obviously, if you get enough compression, enough osteophyte formation, it can have compression on the spinal cord if it's up in the cervical spine or down in, uh, below in the lumbar spine, which is so common and leads to pinching off of uh, the nerve roots as they go beyond the, the end of the uh, spinal canal and, and within the spinal canal still cause results in compression and that's spinal stenosis. Here's another example radiographically loss of the normal curve because the muscles are now tight in an effort to limit the mobility because it's painful. And you see here, loss of joint space, or I, I should say disc space, which is the disc degeneration, and you'll get some osteophyte formation in some of the facet joints, which are the true arthritic joints of the spine. So how come this happens? <clears throat> uh, there are a lot of factors involved. Trauma, let's say relatively early on. The young person who traumatizes a joint uh, with sports, and this is particularly true of professional sport, sports people. So they traumatize their joints uh, com most common in football, but also basketball and other sports. The result is <clears throat> that they set up subsequent damage to the car articular cartilage, and it may not fully repair. And I'll go into the details of why they may not repair adequately. Obesity itself is a factor. And it's particularly important, uh, obviously, for uh, lower extremity joints. Uh, if you have, for every pound of excess weight you have, you're actually putting someplace between three to five pounds on hip and knee joints. So there's a factor of three to five. So somebody who is, say, 20 pounds overweight is actually putting something in the order of 60 to 100 pounds excess on those lower extremity joints with each time, with each step. Malformation of a joint. And the classic example are people who have shallow uh, <clears throat> acetabuli. Uh, they result in early osteoarthritis of their hips. Uh, there are other malformations that develop or hypermobility disorders. People who have Ehlers-Danlos syndrome or just the hypermobility form of Ehlers-Danlos, so-called Ehlers-Danlos 6, uh, <clears throat> they have over-mobility of those joints and they, uh, because of friction, and et cetera, they are, uh, wear that cartilage down more rapidly. There's a gen genetic factors, and the genetic is the most common. And so if mother has <clears throat> had osteoarthritis of her hands, Heberden's and Bouchard's nodes, the first carpal, metacarpal joints, there's a high percentage of their, her daughters and a moderate percentage of her sons who are going to have it as well. And again, I use myself as an example. My mother had significant uh, primary osteoarthritis with Heberden's and Bouchard's nodes and hand involvement, and here I am. Uh, <clears throat> there are endocrine diseases that will hyperthyroidism, and hypothyroidism particularly, uh, <clears throat> are, are more obscure endocrine diseases. We see osteoarthritis more commonly in patients who have diabetes, particularly the type 2 diabetes patients. So that combination is frequent. Crystal deposition diseases, patients who have 
gout, particularly chronic recurrent gout, each time they have inflammation in a joint, it sets up the potential for cartilage destruction. The result is they are may have somewhat premature, if you will, osteoarthritis. A common disorder that is a crystal deposition disease is calcium pyrophosphate crystal deposition disease, so-called pseudogout. Even patients who do not have true clinical episodes of pseudogout, but have chondrocalcinosis, which you can easily see on uh, joint films, are set up to have uh, excess factors in development and mechanical factors, if you will, in the, for the development of osteoarthritis. Patients who've had inflammatory arthritis, patients who have rheumatoid arthritis, even if we suppress the inflammatory panis synovitis, may result in having secondary osteoarthritis. What you're doing there is you're activating the innate immune system in the development of osteoarthritis. It's not really immunologically uh, driven in the sense of antibody formations, etc. But the innate portion of the immune system uh, is activated much like any other inflammation. So those are the sort of mechanical or predisposing factors to osteoarthritis development. If you look at normal cartilage, a normal joint, cartilage is smooth, it is low in friction, and it glides. Most of us think about uh, joints like the knee joint as being a hinge. Well, it is a hinge, yes, but it also has a gliding component. So it's not a, a simple hinge, it's a hinge with a certain amount of glide. And normally that is smooth, easy, and there's a, it's covered with joint fluid, which gives it a little uh, simplicity of mobility, if you will. That joint fluid is clear, it's thin, there's not much of it. It covers the cartilage surface. It's full of hyaluronic acid and another proteolycan 4 called lubricin. The cartilage underneath it is full of collagen fibers that are sort of, which produce that sort of tensile strength that you want in the cartilage. And the chondrocytes, which are the only cells within normal cartilage, and those cells are not usually very uh, recoverable. You know, you can, uh, if you have a loss of liver cells, those liver cells will regenerate. Skin regenerates. Other organs to some degree can regenerate. The chondrocytes cartilage does not regenerate any more than myocardial cells regenerate. So the only cells that are in hyaline cartilage, and we're talking about joints that have uh, so-called diarthroidal joints, joints that have uh, cartilage coverage. They do not regenerate to any degree. They normally produce the proteoglycans of so-called brown substance, which embeds the cartilage. If you think of it as sort of like reinforced concrete that has uh, steel fibers within the concrete, and these are the supporting mountains. The difference is that that supporting structure, the ground substance is compressible to some degree. So it, with each step, with each motion, it compresses a little bit. And that becomes the, uh, the important item of normal mobility, normal use of joints. So, the, to look at it very, uh, grossly, here is a normal joint, and notice how this cartilage covers the joint nice and smoothly. There's a little in the joint space because there's just a little bit of fluid in there, 
and only under circumstances of inflammation, whether it's trauma or it's subsequent uh, osteoarthritis or it is an inflammatory disease like the gout or rheumatoid arthritis, only then is there increased fluid production from the synovium, which is primarily at the edges. So what's the difference between, say, normal aging cartilage and osteoarthritis cartilage? Normally, as we age, there's less water in that ground substance, in that cartilage. Uh, the chondromucoproteins, uh, particularly chondroitin sulfate and hyaluronic acid, they're okay. They stay around. They may disappear to some degree. One of the link proteins, which is part of the complex hyaluronic acid, uh, that seems to get this decreased. The resulting is, yes, you lose some cartilage. But by and large, it stays around. It's just sort of more brittle, if you will, or somewhat thin, but it functions. By contrast, in osteoarthritis, the amount of water is actually, particularly early on, increased. And the, there's an effort on the part of the, uh, <clears throat> the chondrocytes to overproduce, to try to compensate and but as they go along and they give up, then the, uh, the um, glycoaminoglycans, particularly chondroitin sulfate, hyaluronic acid, keratin sulfate, those begin to disappear. Whereas the link protein may still be around, but they disappear. So there is a difference in the metabolism of uh, that cartilage. Let's look at it another way. Here's the normal structure of articular cartilage. There's a very thin layer, layer of epithelium in here, the so-called synovial cells at the top. There's a filling in here of, of collagen fibers, and it's embedded in it's non-calcified, so a radial zone of cartilage. And that's where all these chondrocytes are. Whoops, sorry about that. That's where all these chondrocytes are sitting. And only down at the bottom or close to the bone is a sort of calcification of the cartilage and subchondral bone. Now I'd point out one other thing. Cartilage does not have nerve ending. So cartilage by itself in its damage does not hurt. The pain that you get from osteoarthritis comes from bone, bone compression, and from ligaments and tendons that are uh, being malused, if you will, or overused. So that is the nature of normal cartilage. It is when these cells begin to disappear, cannot produce the normal ground substance, that that begins to crack, decrease, and secondarily, these collagen fibers begin to fragment. <clears throat> Once they fragment, they don't rep replace. It's, it, in a sense, it's game over. You're on your way. So that becomes important clinically. I'll describe, discuss that with you in a minute. Here's what this <clears throat> joint looks like grossly. Here's nice, smooth cartilage. And here is the big pitting loss cartilage. Here's some osteophytes out here. Here's an area of lost cartilage, damaged surrounded by still intact cartilage. Obviously this joint 
is badly damaged, doesn't move normally, and should have produced a lot of pain. So what are we doing? By the time a patient begins to complain to us, they already have damage of that cartilage. They're probably well on their way to uh, irreversible change. In other words, they're at a point where the amount of the option, the option or the opportunity to stop the process or even begin to reverse it may have passed. We can talk about some of the potentials going forward. So at that point, what do we want to do? We want to relieve their symptoms and make them comfortable. We like them to keep and maintain or maybe even improve their function. And this is possible. We certainly want to limit their physical disability and we want to avoid drug toxicity. And as I said early on, we want to make sure that they don't have, uh, that we don't run into too much polypharmacy, which could really be complicated. And particularly as people get older, renal function is diminished and their potential for gastric uh, complications increases. So, you have to assume and begin to educate the patient. You have a slowly progressive chronic disease and we have to manage it. And part of that management is going to be very much up to you. I can show you how to do it. We can get ancillary help to show you how to do it. Medications will help it. It won't make it go away. We're not going to reverse it. We want to keep your function. And you have to review all of the issues that are involved. This is particularly true with uh, obesity. Uh, a lot of your patients uh, are going to be overweight. We know that that's a big problem in the United States. Uh, and <clears throat> they're going to come in with osteoarthritis of their knee, hip, ankle, or all of the above. And uh, one of the big problems is to get their weight off. And as they use these joints less, it's harder for them, their mobility is reduced, it's harder for them to lose weight. So there's a lot of issues involved with this. And that runs into the other uh, common things that you run into. These are often diabetic patients. They, they have cardiac disease, pulmonary disease, limiting their function, their activities, and therefore, it's easy to overeat relative to the amount of physical energy they expend. So one of the things we want to do is have them be taught a range of motion exercise, muscle strengthening exercises, along with their aerobic conditioning. That's where physical therapists come in. They can show the patient what to do Ultimately, the patient has to take that home and implement it themselves. Uh, the same goes with the use of assistive devices. Patients, by and large, are going to resist it. I don't need that equipment. I don't want to have a cane. I don't want special shoes. Uh, on the other hand, it provides them with the ability to maintain independence improve their function, and it's a, often a safety factor in terms of their ability to go up and down the stairs, uh, take care of themselves, use their normal facilities, etc. Uh, we're very concerned with the issues of activities or their daily living, their home safety. Keep it simple. Make sure that they don't have problems uh, that are part of their household, use adaptive equipment. There are all kinds of inexpensive adaptive items. You can go to <clears throat> any hardware store and a lot of grocery stores are going to have it. As a matter of fact, I'm sure most of you are familiar with the uh, OXO line of uh, <clears throat> 
a somewhat adaptive, commonly used uh, kitchen stuff. The reason that was developed was by patients, actually it was developed by patients who had rheumatoid arthritis and then developed, uh, organized and developed a business out of it. It increases the size of the handles so that people who have arthritic problems, whether it's rheumatoid arthritis, osteoarthritis, or any other hand involvement can still use this kind of larger handle equipment and maintain their function in the kitchen. They don't have to go to somebody else to open the jar to uh, be, do whatever they want. A home exercise regimen. This is terribly important to get the patient involved with this whole thing. Uh, it becomes sort of like, uh, if you will, uh, it's, it's arthritis toilet training. Uh, these are, if you can get them to look at this in terms of you brush your teeth and you wash your face, this is one more thing you do. This is part of your life. Weight control and diet, and I'm sure that all of you, this is a big, big problem. What about some of these other uh, things available? If your patient can get into programs of somewhat modified yoga, Tai Chi, Pilates, here, for instance, in San Francisco, there are Tai Chi classes run by the public library. And they're really quite good. Uh, they're free. Uh, <clears throat> they're in small groups. Um, they meet once, you, once or, or twice a week. And a lot of people can get to them uh, and participate. Uh, <clears throat> Pilates is a little more sophisticated. Let's talk a little bit about uh, footwear. An awful lot of your patients are going to come in and uh, cheap, simple uh, shoes or slipper-like uh, footwear, which just uh, actually exacerbates the pronation of their feet and particularly hind foot valgus. You want them to be able to get a decent pair of shoes. It has now become much more popular to wear uh, running type shoes, which gives a nice stability to the, and a fair amount of support, particularly hind foot support with adequate room in the toe box. Uh, the other advantage is it gets women out of high heels, which uh, I realize doesn't have the same uh, <clears throat> fashion cachet, but if you look carefully at an awful lot of women, who have been uh, wearing high heels most of their life, even moderately high heels, their uh, dorsiflexion of their foot is limited because they have now shortened Achilles tendons. Use of splints and braces are fine for acute episodes, but you don't really want patients to wear them all the time except for perhaps excess work becomes very useful to have a splint on your, uh, on your wrist, for instance, when if you're gonna work in the kitchen or you're gonna do some handy work at home uh, or you wanna do some outside work, that's fine, wear the splint for the heavy work. But then you wanna get out of the splint and do your range of motion exercises and do exercises that maintain muscles. We can get into the details of different kinds of muscle uh, training programs or, and types of exercises, but I think that uh, that's another subject all by itself. The point of all of this is the more you can get the patient to uh, be involved in these issues, the less they're dependent upon medication, the less problems they have with medication potential problem, potential adverse effects. So what about medication? Well, acetaminophen works as an analgesic. Try to stay away from narcotics. Yeah, narcotics are fine if you have acute episodes, but narcotics, as I'm sure you all are fully aware, 
cause a lot of other issues and <clears throat> patients can become dependent upon them, if not even addicted. Anti-inflammatory drugs, ANSIDs, by and large, are more effective for osteoarthritis than acetaminophen alone, probably because there is a modest uh, inflammatory component to osteoarthritis. Not the same as we see with the more inflammatory diseases like RA. Hydroxychloroquine has been used really for a subset of osteoarthritis patients who seem to have a more significant inflammatory set of patients who seem to have sort of erosive osteoarthritis. There are no good uh, double blind, carefully done uh, studies to confirm that uh, the hydroxychloroquine is uh, all that useful. However, it's really one of the safest long-term agents we have. I would not urge you to use it regularly for your osteoarthritis patients. Intraarticular steroids are fine if someone has an acute exacerbation of one joint. Uh, and sometimes that happens. A knee will suddenly get uh, very painful and somewhat swollen. Fine. Aspirate it. And you can uh, aspirate knees uh, is really quite simply to get, if you're not used to doing it, get one of your, uh, if you have a rheumatologist handy, more commonly an orthopedic surgeon, and to teach you how to uh, uh, aspirate a knee so you can get fluid for analysis if you need to diagnostically, but also so that you can inject the knee occasionally with corticosteroids. Visco supplementation. There are a whole bunch of these on the market. They're, and they've been studied and studied and studied. If you look at all of the studies, those that have been supported by the drug companies that make the agent seem to uh, show positive results. If you do look at the studies that are, have been done, uh, funded by other means than the manufacturers, you find out there is little to any benefit from the visco supplementation. How about topical treatments? Well, capsaicin uh, <clears throat> treatment is fine, except it's difficult to use and it can have some adverse effects and it's very temporary. But what's very commonly available over the counter are the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory creams. And uh, <clears throat> those uh, patients will use, however, and they are effective and it avoids a lot of the systemic issues with the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. However, you have to use it multiple times a day. And if you use it once a day, it's not gonna be sufficient. But three to four times a day, uh, a joint that's giving a lot of trouble can be quite helpful and it's really uh, quite safe and that's fine. And it's not very expensive. What about herbal remedies? Uh, glucosamine, chondroitin sulfate, questionable if, if at all beneficial. Turmeric, if you could use a large amount of it, huge amounts of it, it has some anti-inflammatory effect, but the ordinary amount of turmeric that one would get over the counter medications or even uh, dousing some of your food with it is not going to be very effective or beneficial. What about the orthopedic approaches? Well, arthroscopy is only useful for a few specific things like torn meniscus or some impingement due to some loose bodies, which really is or, uh, represents pieces of cartilage that are floating around. Rotator cuff repair does work. However, you gotta represent rotator cuff repair takes probably six plus months to get full results and it is an arduous physical therapy response. Uh, and in 
younger people, uh, like 40s and 50s or 60s, who uh, have a uh, <clears throat> tear of super and or infraspinatus muscle, uh, they'll probably get 80 to 90 percent good result if they get a good surgical result and they good a long term physical therapy. So, by example, my daughter, age 60, uh, had a, a rotator cuff repair and it took her six months. And yeah, she's back playing some tennis. Uh, by contrast, if I were to have uh, my rotator cuff repaired, I would probably have an order in the order of 50% good result, and it would take six months to get that. So it becomes relatively useless the old, older and longer uh, the uh, damage has occurred. Osteotomy for a knee buys you some time, but we're really looking at arthroplasties of knees, hips, first carpal metacarpal joints, patella. Ankle is questionable beneficial. We've already talked about shoulder. Shoulder replacement does help in terms of pain release, modest motion, but still limited motion, and a long rehabilitation. I would also point out that, that knee uh, arthroplasty is very good, but it takes a lot to get good motion back. If your patient isn't willing or capable of uh, proceeding with a long-term careful physical therapy regimen, to get nearly full extension, and at least 100 to 125 degrees of flexion, they're not gonna get a good result. They're not gonna be able to function. You gotta have at least 90 to 100 degrees in order to go up and down steps. Fusion, of course, gets rid of pain. Ah, gotta go through all of this. Dr. Bernhard, I just wanted to let you know we have we're at the two minute warning. We have two minutes left. Oh well. <laughs> so I would ask people, do you have questions now at this point that you would like to uh, ask? Yeah. And let's see if that will uh, yeah. that. so our first question is what is your experience with regenerative medicine for treatment of arthritis? Okay, so where are we with that? Let's see if I can bring that slide up here. Therapies on the horizon. And what you talk about regenerative is stem cell. It's not ready for prime time. That's the conclusion. Why is it ready for prime time? Depends very definitely upon where you get your stem cells, what time, in the course of the disease process, you're doing it. And what markers you're going to have or complications that you may have as a consequence. It has not been adequately standardized. There are not really good enough long-term adequate control trials. It's not consistently the same uh, source of stem cell. So it's a nice idea, but it is not ready for prime time. There are a lot of clinics out there that are selling, quote, stem cell injections for knee osteoarthritis. You have to question very carefully as to where are they getting the stem cells? What are they? Are they really stem cells? Uh, and uh, are they just uh, some other cells and they're buying some time and the patient says, oh, I'm, I'm doing well. They may be doing well for a while. The question is, uh, is it really stem cell? And they're costly. I mean, the, these are not covered by insurances or Medicare and it costs a lot of money. I mean, thousands and thousands of dollars. 
The other question is what about platelet-rich plasma? Again, not a nice idea, not for prime time. Lack of standardization, not adequate good clinical studies, not as yet appro approved. What about other agents? Things that might look at the issue of cartilage regeneration by stopping or altering the destructive chemical process. And that's where all these others are at. Bone matrix, pepsin, MAP kinase inhibitors, cytokine inhibitors, all have been tried or are in the process of being studied. The wind signaling uh, inhibition, these are all in clinical trials that are now, several of them are in phase one, a few in phase two trials. We have yet to see anything dramatic. The only one that seems to possibly have uh, some potential use that has had some real, uh, reasonable trials has gone into uh, phase three uh, is the fibroblast growth, growth factor called spiroferman. There is radiographic evidence of some improvement in uh, cartilage uh, regeneration, but as yet is not at the level of good clinical improvement. There are probably a subset of those patients who uh, will clinically improve. And that has to be defined as to what that subset is, what criteria we have. I'll go back to the issue early on that I mentioned. The problem is that all of these have the potential of either slowing or stopping the progressive process or actually causing some regeneration. Remember, you have to regenerate the chondrocytes and you have to catch the disease process before the collagen fibers have broken down. Almost all the patients we see come in late stage osteoarthritis because they've ignored the early signs and symptoms that they've had or the potential for that. And they uh, use over-the-counter medications and now come to us because they really hurt badly and they had advanced disease. So <clears throat> to be able to reverse that advanced disease becomes a great, great problem. So all of these studies are, uh, are potentially good, particularly for the pe people who have very early disease. And sometimes you can identify that because someone, for instance, who has a, a torn meniscus has a, is a setup for osteoarthritis, and you can may identify that early on, and perhaps some of these agents will be useful. So we're, we're at the dawn of something, but it's really the dawn. Does that answer the question? I think so. Thank you. That was a very great answer. We have another question. Um, I have some patients who come in for steroid knee injections every three to six months. Usually after about two years, we review the likely need to see ortho. Any guidelines about how long a person can safely undergo repeated steroid injections? There is, there is a lot of concern about if you inject a knee, for instance, frequently and the patient gets by for it and they therefore run around on that knee because now it feels okay. Uh, is that bad? They're gonna run that knee down faster? Perhaps. There is some evidence that that may be the case. It's not clear. There have been some long-term observational studies suggesting that maybe that's a factor, uh, but and you have to sit down and say with the given patient, when is the time that you say enough, I need a knee arthroplasty and am I a good candidate for it? And that's when you sit down and say to the patient, do you realize what you're talking about? It's not 
you know, it, this is not something where you go into the shop, you get a new knee and fine, I'm fine, I'm, I'm great. Yeah, it's a significant procedure. It has its own potential hazards, infection, thrombophobitis, et cetera. And there is a significant uh, post-op rehabilitation process. And if you don't do and go through the full, full rehabilitation process with uh, design and vigor, you're not going to get a good result. You're going to be a very unhappy person. And with any luck, and hopefully you will not get any loosening as time goes on. In other words, you will not tear up that knee. And I can use myself as an example. I know what the process is post-op. It is not for the faint of heart. It is uh, not a walk in the park. This is a, a, a real commitment. But the result is, yeah, I can walk on that knee that I couldn't before. This is so bad I limited my walking. Now I can do it. Yes, was it worth it? You bet. But it took that process. Uh, I hope that gives you a sense. Can you put off the uh, osteo the uh, arthroplasty? Sure. Pick your surgeon very carefully, but also your rehabilitation program. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Dr. Bernhard. I don't see any other questions, but we will pause for one second and we'll wait just in case you have any last minute questions and get them into the Q&A box. But if you think of us a question after this session, please always feel free to submit a consult to Dr. Bernhardt or any of our Maven Project volunteers. They are more than happy to, to answer those questions um, in cases. Uh, oh, uh, one last comment about non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. I don't think there's any one NSAID that's better than another or more effective. The only question is, which one is less likely to produce uh, <clears throat> or cause problems. And the problems are really two. One, of course, is renal insufficiency. Patients who are, are renally insufficient probably should not be on an NSAID. Uh, older patients who have normal renal function can handle an NSAID okay. And the other is gastrointestinal. Uh, and therein we run into the same problem, which one is better? And I really, the data on that is not that clear. Yes, if we had a pure COX-2 inhibitor, uh, that would be fine. Those were tried and they're off the market, i.e. Vioxx is no longer for other reasons which are cardiovascular in nature. So um, that's where you're at, you're at. Be careful of your patient when you prescribe an NSAID. Let's say you prescribe meloxicam. Be careful that they are not also popping ibuprofen or Aleve and don't realize that that's a, a, a non-steroid and inflammatory drug. Thank you so much, Dr. Bernhard. This was wonderful. We did have a comment in the chat that said, thank you so much for an excellent review. So thank you so much for spending your morning with us and thank you all for attending. Okay.